I'd, I'd, I'd like, to, like to start by thanking Rain Mackay, who is the ED of the Craft Council of BC, for her support and uh, for not answering my emails whenever I told her I was going to quit <laughs> because it came up a few times. As we all, for all of you who have practiced start, we always have a little bit of angst when it comes to solo exhibitions. Um, I also want to thank the volunteer and staff at the gallery who helped me uh, install the exhibition. There were over 200 little pieces to unwrap and install in a particular way. So it was a big job to get the exhibition up. And uh, so it was nice not to do it all on my own. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but one of the criteria for exhibiting um, at the BC Craft Council is that you have to push your work in some way. You have to extend your boundaries, whether maybe trying a new material or really doing an investigation within your own practice in a certain way, something that's different. And I really appreciate this mandate um, because it made me really expand and I could expand without worry. I wasn't set um, to too strict an agenda, though I'm sure Rain at times wished I had been. Um, one of the questions I've been asked is, um, when did you decide to become an artist? And that's kind of a question that we all hate as artists because it's really hard to pinpoint that time. So I, but I took the question seriously and I started to think back in time to about the age of 10, when I was a young girl um, at my grandparents' cottage, God, Lake of Bays in Ontario. Now, my cousins were a raucous crew, and so was my brother. And they want to go water skiing and sailing in the boats. And they'd ask me to come along, and I'd say, no, thank you. Uh, I'm perfectly happy sitting on the shores of the lake and listening to the water lap in. I would take rocks and I'd make these little villages out of the rocks. I'd start developing characters and I'd make up narratives. I was in my own little dream world. Well, I haven't changed much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still creating rocks, though I'm making the rocks now, and I'm still arranging them and when I'm in my studio, I'm still a raconteur. I'm still telling myself stories. And um, I, find it, I found that question particularly relevant to me right now as I, look on, as I looked at my work and sort of where did it come from? Part of what I'm gonna try and do in this talk is to pull out threads from my past because I did tie a lot of different things together uh, to bring this show uh, together for you at the Craft Council. Um, though I can say I kind of morphed into being an artist, I did formalize an artistic career by doing a BFA in the 80s uh, at Queen's University. It was a time of formalism. My teachers were all from the Slade School of Art in England. Anthony Caro was the guru of sculpture. Yeah, he's, he's still good stuff, right? But we talked about the principles and elements of design, so form, shape, color, all of those great things in artwork, and the content of the work, activating space. Um, and I loved it. I loved dealing with those, those concepts, and I still deal with that in my work. So it could be, you know, in the design of a form, I'm thinking about those concepts. Maybe it's in the spacing, how far apart things are from each other. Those are all aesthetic decisions. As well as how do I finalize the structure of the work. So this is an example of a template that I developed um, and this is how we installed the work in the, ga in the gallery. Um, so though it may seem random with how the shapes are organized, there's a lot of careful consideration on how they all um, relate to each other. But with informalism, where was my voice? Where were the stories from Lake of Bays? Where was my narrative if the content of the work was activating space? Little did I know at the time, philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard published The Postmodern Condition. This seminal work, um, he published it in French in 79 and in English in 84. I didn't really kind of get this stuff until I did my grad degree um, in the no early 90s. Uh, but one section of it really made sense to me. It's when he started to talk about utterances. An utterance, a small voice, a petit récit, the small narrative. 
um, that works and intervenes the meta narrative. So what what he was doing was sort of opening up a space for voice, and a meta an example of a meta narrative could be, for example, the white cube of the gallery wall, which at the time was really dominated by a lot of male artists, male curators. Um, and certainly, if you wanted to include thread or any other material in your work, you were kind of categorized as something else, and you really weren't allowed into the big cube. So that was the meta narrative that I was really voicing against at the time. Um, but it's important that these little narratives remain the quintessential form um, of imaginative invention. So those small voices that we have, sometimes we're rubbing up against a meta narrative. They're the voices to listen to because they're the ones that are our imagination and have great importance. They're the ones that can topple meta narratives. So a little out of focus with this slide. It was 2004. I was probably a little out of focus at the time as well. Um, I decided to play on um, uttering. This is fluttering. And uh, what I decided was like, what do my utterances look like? Like if I was actually going to make an utterance, what would it look like? And what materials would I use? So I started to play with this. And as a daily activity, I would start making these little, they were only about this big, sort of on the end of, of wires. That's wax and thread. I didn't really care about the materials. There's some kiln cast glass, again, bound wire. Uh, that you can't really, not the best photo, but that's just, that's just some canvas that I've painted. It's sort of a thingamabob. No, uh, you know, like I didn't want to think too closely about what I was making. I wanted it to be more like a 3D journal entry and uh, also playing around um, with organic shapes. Um, so the idea of taking these utterances and then I didn't put them on the wall. I thought of myself more as piercing the gallery wall. So I'm piercing the meta narrative with my utterances. So using the politics of the gallery as sort of part of the intention of the piece. So using, you know, when you, when you do do an installation work, you do have to think about where you're installing because that gallery space actually can give you quite a lot of information. And that becomes important with how I developed the piece in the craft council. And I know Rain's panicking because she's thinking, okay, what's the, meta -na what's the narrative coming out of the craft council? I'm not sure what it is. Um, the other uh, material, of course, I've used a lot of is glass. And a lot of, not a lot, but people are saying like, okay, Jenny, where's the glass? Like that's what we know you for is your glass work. Um, so the glass work is really important to the development of the piece in the gallery. Um, and so I sort of want to go back uh, into this work uh, probably about five years ago. And that's when I moved back to Canada from New Zealand. I learned my glass work when I was in New Zealand and worked in kiln cast glass. This, uh, the body of artwork I'm sort of, I'm going to go into with you was important because it brought a few components together. One was working with technology. Um, I was introduced to 3D printing uh, using um, a lot of different software, Rhino and Fusion 360, um, developing comfort with using technology. And when you, you know, you look at my age, right? Like I'm not born into technology. So there was quite a learning curve to being able to use software and so on where I could actually be creative with it. Um, and some other themes that we'll get into. So I moved back to Whistler in about 2014. Um, from New Zealand with the family. And there uh, I met three great women, Margaret Forbes, Trisha Nakagawa, and Miriam DeLangley, and we formed the Mountain Object Makers Cooperative. Uh, we had two ceramicists, two glass makers, two jewelry makers, and the cooperative went for a good three years. So I had three years with kilns, and it was a lively studio to work in. Unfortunately, as with is happening with a lot of artist studios now, the landlord sold the warehouse space because the space was had a very high value to it, uh, high enough that boy I I couldn't buy it. So, uh, anyways, um, there was one particular rock face in Whistler that I really liked. 
Landscape was important to me. It was, it was my identity. It was sort of my terra firma. I had arrived from New Zealand. New Zealand's are the beaches and water. I'm, I'm a New Zealand citizen as well. So I have this affinity to the landscape there and the affinity to the landscape in Canada. And it's sort of the commonality that I have between both countries. So I remember going for a walk with my husband along the Valley Trail and I said, oh, I'd love to make that rock face out of glass. But you know, it's pretty big, right? So I didn't have a kiln that big. And then if I made a rubber mold of it, I think the environmentalists would come after me for like putting goop all over this sort of fragile ecosystem. But I think what I really wanted to do was somehow just capture this rock face and take it home with me, you know, just sort of being able to embrace that rock face. Now, while I'm thinking about this, I have enrolled in a workshop in Medalta. And I don't know if you've heard of Medalta, but it's one of the premier um, ceramic centers in Canada. Uh, and they were offering a course called Bits to Atoms. The bits referred to uh, 3D printing and using technology, and the atoms were making molds from those 3D prints. So um, it was sort of synchronicity that I was thinking about how am I going, what am I going to do with this rock face? And about a month out from that workshop, I contacted James Kuhn, who was teaching the 3D printing, and said, hey, um, I have this idea. I want to kind of do and capture this rock face. And he said, right, have you heard of scanning? Anyway, oh yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a photocopier. I know how to, no, this is called 3D scanning. And I went, okay. Yeah, I don't have a fancy scanning. He goes, don't worry about it. Take your camera, photograph it from all these different angles. I've got the software that'll weave it all together for you. I went, wow, cool. It's called photogra photogrammetry. Photogrammetry? Photogrammetry. Um, and I love the idea I could take out my old, my, you know, my camera, like old school, and actually bring it into new school. I love, I love that sort of juxtaposition. So that's what I did. And, uh, I sent him the photograph and he sent me back this image of the, of the, uh, of the rock face and there it was on my computer. I said, okay, great, what do I do with it now? You know? So it took a while to develop a workflow because he can't manipulate meshes and I don't know any computer geeks in here, but we developed a way of working with the drape and I was able to uh, start playing with it, start playing with this rock face on my computer screen. Um, I still hadn't made anything yet, but um, what I decided is I didn't want to just reproduce a rock face. So I, what I wanted to do was take a sample, like a core sample. So taking something small out of something larger, which relates to the theme in the gallery right now, and also brings in the reason for the circle, that the core samples are always circular. And I'm sort of, if you can take out the microcosm of the macrocosm, it's representative of that. I don't need to give you all the information. I just want you to see what I'm interested in. And uh, here it is just on the computer. I'm sort of figuring it out a little bit more. And then I arrive in Medicine Hat you know, it's flat as a pancake out there. It's not much. I've never been there. I was sort of like, why is this place in Medicine Hat? Well, it turns out the whole place is made of clay, so that's why it's there. Um, and I, we had a, a party, like a welcoming party. There were about eight of us in the course. And I finally met James Kuhn. We'd been talking on the computer for a month. And what he did is he handed me the 3D print of the rock face. So there I was in Medicine Hat, Alberta, holding my rock face and I was like a, you know like this gas this pillow of air I didn't really know what to think and here I'll pass that around you can hold a little bit of whistler um, and over here I'm going to also pass around further scans and these are um, from the tidal beach uh, patterns in Matapuri New Zealand I'm going to start it back here with my New Zealand friend who um, there you go you can know so you see, they're light, but what it is, is it's capturing the landscape. And um, there's another example of it up close. So I started working with these 3D prints. So wonderment, that moment of holding Whistler rock face in my hand and gasping for air and sort of, wow, I, know, I felt like a kid who'd just been given a snow globe. You know that feeling of like, wow. 
that's where wonderment comes in, this gasp of air, this moment of not knowing. And, you know, I think we hear the word wonderment quite a lot right now. Uh, it sort of seems to be a contemporary thing. But actually, I'm going to give you a quote from Aristotle in like metaphysics. He goes way back, right? So he says, it is through wonder that men, of course men, begin and originally began to philosophize. It's the internal state preceding critical thought. So it's pre-knowledge. It's the precursor to invention. So I was just fascinated. And it was true. It's like this suspended animation where you're, you haven't yet formulated an idea. And I really, really like that. I like the fact that um, somehow wanting to capture that. And I started to work from there. Um, I really like printing with my 3D printer in very low resolution because I like these lines on how it printed, and that works its way into the work. There's a beauty to it. Um, so this is a small glass piece, only about this size, and it's off the wall. And uh, it was scanned from up the peak in Whistler. It was really cold when I was scanning it. Um, so going out into my environment with my camera, hiking and finding things that I'm interested in in the landscape. Here's uh, Matapuri Beach. So you'll see the scans that are coming around. So, you know, they're about this size. This is unfinished landscape because the 3D printer stopped printing in the middle of the print. And at first I was like, ah, oh, darn. But you see this nice grid in here? Yeah, that's looking into the 3D print. Um, and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. So I made a rubber mold of it and then uh, went through the process to get it into kiln cast glass. Uh, there's the circle again. So the circle has been very prevalent in my work for quite a long time. The final piece of my glass that I'll show you is this one called Whistler Rock Faces. Each piece is about this sort of size, 15 centimeters. Um, it's doing a jig right now in um, Ireland. It's in the Ireland Glass Biennale, happily going to be shown at Dublin Castle. I thought that's really cool. Um, anyways, uh, there was a lot of complicated mold making to get this where the rock face is on the inside. I love the idea that through glass, you could sort of see the back side of the front side, like you're able to see all the way through. What you don't see in this work is the sheer amount of polishing that I had to do. So with kiln cast glass, it's coming out of the kiln in plaster. And the glass is a mess when it comes out. It looks like nothing. It's not until you actually spend hours and hours and days and weeks and months of polishing that you end up with a piece like this. Um, it's very different from blown glass and so on. Uh, and uh, my wrists remember the polishing, my elbows remember the polishing, my whole body remembers the polishing, and I really was starting to question why was I working in glass? Because I had previous to this, this, this is why I wanted to bring the earlier work, had an affinity with multiple materials. But somehow I had pigeoned myself in as a glass artist. It's a beautiful material. It's a very seductive material because you know no matter what, it's going to be beautiful. So I decided it was time for a transition. And I put all of my glass making equipment into storage. I knew if I kept it out, I would start using it. Also, maybe because our studio in Whistler had just closed its doors, so I didn't really have room to be making this work. Uh, but more importantly, I needed a break from glass, and I think it's like you need to sometimes take a holiday from where you're at to be able to look back at what you've done. Um, there was only one problem. I had an exhibition booked with the BC Craft Council, and I was like minus one year, um, I had no idea what I was going to do. I didn't tell Rain this, of course. Um, and um, so I was a little bit panicked because uh, I knew, you know, they were expecting me to do an exhibition of my glass and it was now in storage. Uh, so I um, just quietly started to think about uh, the gallery space. I'm going to start with the big picture, work myself in, maybe I'll think of something. So I started to think about what does the craft space mean? What does exhibiting in a craft gallery mean? And for me, the community of craft 
kind of opens its boundaries. It, it, it brings in artists on the borderline. It brings in artists who work in multiple materials. It's respectful of technique and of skill. So unlike the work with utterances where I felt like I had to pierce the gallery wall, I felt that the craft wall, the craft space was a very embracing space. I still had no idea what I was going to do. Nonetheless, at least there was a concept started that I sort of understood the narrative that I was going to be exhibiting in. I thought maybe I could surround the viewer with all kinds of shapes so that they felt embraced by, by the shapes. Um, and I said, well, what kind of shapes are embracing? So I started playing around with organic shapes uh, because they sort of morph. I thought, could I morph the gallery walls in some way? Um, and uh, yeah, I still didn't know what I was going to do and what I was going to make it out of. Uh, but I did, I sort of had the start of a concept. In my kiln cast glass work, I work a lot with plaster. I'm making molds, refractory molds. That's where the glass gets put into to take on the shape. Um, and I mean, I love plaster. It sort of gets to the state where it's like a meringue or like vanilla icing. And you, like I almost salivate when I'm working with it. So I thought, oh my goodness, I'll work with plaster because, um, is that someone's phone barking? <laughs> okay, <laughs> they, of course it's a dog. <laughs> they go, Where's the dog? Okay, did, was I, did I push a button funny? Um, <clears throat> and um, um, plaster is an interesting material because artists use it to get somewhere else. They use it as a way of making a mold of something, maybe to, you know, as I do, to cast glass. They make a replica of it. It gets used as a prototype, as kind of a material that's on its way to being something else and um, isn't really one that's often investigated. So I thought, that's perfect. A material who needs a voice, who needs to utter. I love it, you know? So, and all of a sudden it was like, well, ta-da, walls were historically made of plaster. I now had the material that suited the concept of an embracing wall in the gallery. I still didn't quite know how I was going to make the piece. About um, eight months earlier or so, I had given to a Kickstarter campaign for a little vacuum former made by Meku. And, um, you know, I get all these reports saying, oh, yes, we're developing this and developing that. And I never saw it. And I thought, okay, well, I've thrown my money away. And all of a sudden, one day, the Meku vacuum former arrived on my doorstep. And it was like, aha, I can make a 3D print. Hold on, I'm gonna get this to you. I gotta show you this, it was really cool. This all happened within like five minutes flat, okay? I had this idea, I'll make organic shapes in 3D printing. I'll then vacuum form a mold over top of it and pour it with plaster. And there was born the workflow for the exhibition. So I'll pass, I'm gonna just pass it. You've seen the 3D print, but hey, here's an organic shape, it has nothing to do with the landscape. Here's a plaster shape, you can now touch them. There you go. And this is a vacuum form mold that uh, I just sort of learned to make. It was very easy with this little machine. Um, but it was very interesting how it just sort of came into place right when it needed to, so I could say to Rain, Rain, I've got this idea. Don't worry, it's all under control. That was a really important part for me. Yeah. She still had no idea what I was up to. Um, so I designed the shapes. I chose the 3D print still because I can't make symmetrical shapes. I'm really bad at it. A 3D printer is really good at it. So it's using technology for what it's good at. You know, my work's not about technology. Technology walks alongside me and I'm able to use it for what I need to. The other thing that I love about the 3D prints is the line work. So in a sense, I allow the 3D print to be a bit of a collaborative partner. And you'll see how I accentuate the, la um, the line when you're looking at the piece in the gallery. So um, I had to invent a lot of shapes. I think I probably made about 50 different shapes. 
I then had to figure out how am I going to cast 50 different shapes. So I sort of, uh, this is in my mother's garage uh, over on Vancouver Island, since it was the only place I could really get, uh, do some work. Um, and I would go over for three or four days at a time and intently work with plaster. I would add materials to plaster. So my first, first ones were white plaster, like the one that's been passed around. I then started to add dyes to the plaster. I started to throw metal into the plaster. I threw sparkles into the plaster. I threw pom-poms into the plaster. I threw whatever I could find into the plaster. Because each time I unmolded it, it was like a gift had been given to me. That sense of wonderment again. And there you can see how many, this is just some of them. I still didn't quite know what I was going to do with them, but I knew that I was on the right track. I had to trust the creative process. Um, so you can see multiples, multiplicity, iteration is also an important component of my work. I don't know if you know the work of Anthony Gormley. Some of the Burnaby school teachers might remember a project I ran with my students where I had them make um, little characters that looked up at us, uh, inspired by Anthony Gormley. Um, so he, uh, a very prolific artist out of the UK, this is one of his earlier installations, um, and I saw it live when I was in New York, and I remember just sort of going around the corner, and <gasps> I was presented by these hundreds of thousands of little clay faces just looking up at me. So it was sort of this dialogue between the artwork and the viewer, and, and who's viewing whom in this? You know, you, you walk around the corner and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eyes are looking up at you. Anthony Gormley, when he was interviewed um, uh, by James Putman, talked about the conventional hierarchy of materials. Well, this is where we come into materiality. And he said, marble and bronze are at the top. And you know, wood and lead in the middle and plaster and clay, the very bottom. You know, and I think that held true for quite a long time. Thankfully, not so anymore. But then I started to wonder, well, where do my materials fit in? It's not even on the top five, you know? It's like, you know, the top 10 universities? Like, I was way down there. Um, where was the room for things like polymer clay or thread and, and color and, um, heaven forbid, pom-poms and fluorescent tassels? Um, so uh, the whole notion of materiality, I had all these materials in my studio that were begging for a voice. And so in the studio, I have these materials that are saying, pick me, pick me, I want to have a voice, I want to be in the gallery. And then uh, at the same time, I have this narrative going through my head. I'm constantly telling myself stories and writing them down in the journal. It was a really noisy place in there, you know, when I was alone. <laughs> so. Uh, I do talk to my materials, I talk to myself, and that's how magic is made. I don't really let people in when that happens. I know my uh, son as a young boy would say, Mom, stop talking to yourself. <laughs> You're so embarrassed. Here's my brother, just to change topics. He has a PhD in physics and uh, astronomy by hobby, and a fairly serious astronomer he is. I spent some time this summer with him in Quebec, up at uh, his cottage, uh, with beautiful clear skies at night. And so he took out his telescope and um, we looked up at the galaxies. And I found it amazing that this round piece of perfect glass here is what focused in the universe, you know, what was out there. I mean, how many of you have laid on your back looking at the summer sky, right? And you feel like this big, right? Um, so again, when I sort of saw this round piece of glass, I knew exactly what I had to do in the installation. I didn't need to expand and embrace you all with objects. I needed to focus you in. And I needed to focus you in thematically. For example, the one piece called Alchemy, I put that's where I experimented with metals and the plaster. The other place, carnival and cotton candy, well, that was all about color and joy and all of those materials. If they were all mixed together, it wouldn't work. And besides, there was a story that was developing in my head. Louise Nevelson, I mean, I, I love a lot of artwork and I look at a lot of artwork, but, but 
Anthony Gormley, Louise Nevelson, even though they're sort of old school, they really influenced my work. So I think that's different as someone who influences to something that you like looking at. And Louise Nevelson, she was one of the first artists that I saw where it wasn't a painting and it wasn't a sculpture. It was something entirely different. And so she refers to that as being neither sculpture nor painting. But she also works thematically, or she might paint a whole uh, area gold, or it might be black, or it might be white. And so you sort of walk into these wonderful sort of almost story-like settings. And uh, when she was interviewed and asked, why did you use gold, or why did you use black, or why did you use white, she, she said, well, I'm, I'm kind of an alchemist. I, um, I use color to sort of change what the piece is about. Because if, if you know Louise Nevelson's work, she would go collect garbage and pieces from around New York City and put them together in these installations. But by painting them the one color, she would then change the story of all of that. And I, I just recently read that she considered herself an alchemist. And I was so excited because I'm an alchemist too, you know? So it's like, we're really like sisters, you know? And I thought that was a nice segue into the narrative. Talk a little bit about the narrative that's in this sculpture. This is our daughter, Madeline. Remember Madeline? Way little, yeah? Well, I'm not the only storyteller in the family. Uh, my daughter, Madeline, actually right now, um, she lives in Australia and she's at what's called a LARP, a live action role play, where they make up stories, they all get together in character, and they play out the stories to see what's going to happen with the story. So she's incredibly creative. She's a better wordsmith than I. So I decided, um, as I was sort of putting my words together that we put around the gallery, that I would collaborate with her because I knew that she could do it a little bit better than me. So I sent the words um, of the narrative. She then tweaked them, definitely made them a lot better. And we sort of batted it back and forth. It was interesting. I was installing the exhibition when I decided to do this. Um, and Rain stayed very calm. Uh, and uh, so I'm on the floor in the gallery with my cell phone. She's on the bus to work in Melbourne because there's like eight hours difference. And she's editing my words. And I said to Rain, Rain, can I have some vinyl letters around the gallery? And she said, sure. I said, Rain, they have to be light gray. That's the formalist in me. It had to work. And she goes, I think that's a special order. And I said, but I'll make it happen. And she did. So I very much appreciate that. So here it is. Whisper gently, uttered the alchemist. For tonight we will become shadows under the clear skies. And tomorrow brings a carnival and cotton candy. And at night we will bathe in the reflection of the moon. Thank you. There we go. And now I invite all of your multitudes of questions so we can have a discussion. <laughs> yes, Bettina. Sorry. Why can't you stop there? Like, why is it important to make more iteration? From the 3D print, yeah. Um, because I so see it as a starting point. I actually am working on a piece right now which is entirely 3D printed. I don't take it any further, and I, I, I can show that to you. Um, I'm continuing with the Wonderment series because I don't feel like I've played it out. I need, I need to keep exploring materials. So um, 3D printing is a material unto itself. And so part of what I've been doing is exploring what makes it uniquely a, a, uniquely a 3D print. As, you know, sort of like the plaster. It's, people use it as a prototype. It doesn't really exist unto its own right. So I've been exploring that a bit further. And then um, here's, here's an example of a 3D print where I've started to um, pause the printer and change colors as I go. 
And so I'm a knitter from way back, like from the age of 10, I used to knit. And there's, um, I don't know if you know about Fair Isle knitting. It is it's Fair Isle as opposed to Fair Isle. Yeah, um, it's, it's different colored knitting. And it's, it's a huge process when you're 3D printing. I have to pause the machine, change colors, pause it again, and it reminded me of knitting. Those times when you have to change color as you're going around. Um, and so uh, I am doing a piece now that's all that connection between Fair Isle knitting and the 3D print. So it's entirely in 3D print. The piece that's the shadows in the exhibition, that's 3D print as well. So that's using the material of 3D print. I don't know if that answers your question, um, but it's, yeah, why do I keep feeling like I need to make molds and to, and to reiterate? I think that's really the, the um, exploration of materials. Yeah, and it was the only way I could get the plaster to be a shape. Plaster needs to get poured into something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It seems, it seems like it's also part of um, that you have to have your hands in there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, th I think that's it's right. It's like you're sticking your, you know, your, your kind of the mark sort of on it. With the, with the automation of the process. Yeah, that's right. Because, I mean, um, you're first of all meddling with it when you're designing the work um, in the software. So the, the work doesn't exist. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the work doesn't exist until you've made it, right? So a lot of people think that you just kind of come up with a shape, you push a button and out it comes. Well, in fact, that's not the case. It takes a long time to design the work. And that's still, even though I'm not using physically my hands with a material like clay, I'm still designing that shape. And then, um, then I have to then program the printer to then print that shape. Um, and there's a lot of meddling you can do with it at that stage. Um, and then I sit there and I watch it because I'm so mesmerized, <laughs> and all these layers that get put down. I mean, I could go to sleep watching my 3D printer. Um, and so that's when I started meddling with the colors, because I thought, hey, what if I change colors as I went? Um, but then it was like, OK, well, all these beautiful lines, how can, I, how, can I exp how can I show people what a 3D printer can offer us? And that's where the plaster came in to, to be able to. Um, but as I said, my work's not about technology. Technology work walks alongside me. When technology gets a little too far ahead of me, it's kind of like, hey, come back here. You know, I'm not ready to go that distance. Um, and, and that's when I bring the hand, hand work into it. I'm still a craftsperson. I'm still an artist. I, I still like getting my hands messy I still, and, and, and enjoy that as well. So I, I like the combination between technology and the hand. So the fast and the slow. So 3D printing can be really slow sometimes, so, yeah. Can you talk about how the work was going to evolve over time? You were talking about the metal, um, the action for the environment. Yeah, so it's particularly in the piece Alchemy, where you see the little metals of, uh, you know, copper and even silver and steel. Um, that, that piece, when I sort of took it out of the mold, um, they were very beautiful. And then when I came back about a week later, you know, with the, the, the moisture and the plaster had rusted all the copper. And so the piece was physically changing and it kept changing. And on some of them, you know, I, I sort of put them in vinegar, you know, to get them to really change. And that's where I really felt like an alchemist. It was like a chemistry experiment in my studio. And my husband's like, oh, that stinks, you know. All that vinegar. <laughs> like, and th those pieces I didn't seal because I, I you know, plaster breathes. It, it, it's not, um, if it gets wet, it's going to absorb the moisture. So if I leave it unsealed, it's going to continue to react. Um, so alchemy, um, carnival and cotton candy, it is like plastered and gloss, you know, plastic. It's not going to, it's not going to absorb anything, but it suited the piece because it's sort of about being at a carnival and the memories of being at a carnival as a kid with all the bright lights and, and the plasticity of it. Yeah. So it will depend on the piece, on, on how it's finished. And I'm going to be continuing to work with other materials. I'm going off to Bullseye Glass in November, where I'll be experimenting more with putt de verre, which is a method of, of tamping very thin glass into a mold. And the reason I'm going to use glass for that piece 
is I want that aspect of fragility. So now I'm not just going to use glass because I know it's going to look good. Is I have a reason for using it as a material. Pat de verre. Yeah, P-A-T-T-E. So it's like a paste of glass. Um, and you, you, you with a, a, a plaster refractory mold, you, you pat it in. So you actually create a very thin layer of glass, which then gets fired sort of to a fusing temperature. And you end up with this really, really thin, paper thin glass. And um, I, I want to try a piece with that because I think it will, it will suit it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I've, you know, I could keep going with all kinds of different materials. In fact, I, I, um, I froze, I, I've been making them out of ice and um, started thinking about working with the environment. And, um, you know, I liked making sand castles as a kid, so um, don't be surprised if we see them made out of sand. Um, and it's all about understanding materials. I mean, I think that's what a craftsperson, what an artist um, does, is they explore their materials. And so that's, that's where I'm at as an artist anyways, is to do that kind of exploration. And to continue with my journals and to continue with writing and to continue with the whole mess. It all comes together somehow. I'm always surprised. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Why? <laughs> why? Don't ask me why or what or how. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's just it's a total creative process, right? Well, yeah, thank you. And, and, and a personal one too, because it's Yeah, and it's always very hard um you know, you're balancing out your personal experiences and there's reasons that I've done a lot of things, but they're they're almost like, oh, they'll never get it because it's just too much, too personal. You know, it's it's I, I have these strange narratives going through my head and it's like I don't wanna listen to them too closely, but I don't want to ignore them either. And when I made this work, actually, I didn't let anybody in my studio. I stayed entirely to myself, except one person, and that's Monica. And she would occasionally come into the studio. She kind of knew that, okay. So I'd invite her in, and she'd, uh, she'd all of a sudden go, <gasps> I go, great, I've done my job. As soon as I knew that she took a gasp in, it's like, great, okay. And if she came in, said, I'm not sure about that. It's like, okay, forget it. That, that didn't work. So you didn't know it, but you were actually a very, very, very good um, critic. Yeah. I, I was just honored that I was involved in this process. I, I, I had only with eight fingers. Oh, yeah, at the end, yes, we had broken fingers. So, yeah, it was, it was uh, yeah. So I won't go into it, but, you know, life does interfere with, uh, with making, and so it was a bit of a hard year for me, so I'm really happy that I actually got the work done, and I didn't quit, and I persevered, because I think maybe out of that came some really um, interesting juxtapositions. Um, I'm really happy with the work, you know, I, I'm quite excited about it. I'm excited to be back in the studio. I'm not feeling drudgery from working in glass. Um, and glass will come back into when I need it because now glass is part of my vocabulary. Um, if I think of myself more um, as a materialist than anything, I can do anything. If I think of myself as a glass artist, I'm, I'm going down a rabbit hole. I'm just a glass artist. I start ignoring what's around me. So it was really a big shift in attitude um, that was important to the development of my work and we'll continue with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. You also made reference to teaching. Mm -hmm. you... I used to teach. Oh, used I to used to teach, teach. yes. Um, this is in the past, yes. I used to teach uh, with the Burnaby School District. So um, I taught uh, for, I think, about five or six years at Burnaby North Secondary School and also at UBC in the Art Education Department. Um, and then I took a break from it. I do adult education courses and so on, but uh, now I barely have time to be in my studio, so I'm not teaching at all, um, which is, I have to say, I quite enjoy. <laughs> um, but I also miss that sharing of information, which, which we get as we teach. I mean, that's a, that is also really nice to be able to do that, so you never know. But at the moment, yeah. Oh, that'd be great. 
Oh, thanks, Rain. That'd be great. Yeah.